Wow. Um, I thought back over the, the many Christmas messages that, that I've given through the years. And I thought about it and I said, well, goodness, I have done a message from Mary's perspective. Obviously, that's that's kind of usual, right? I've done messages from Elizabeth's perspective. I've done message from um, Joseph's perspective. If, if, Joseph, if Joseph hadn't said yes, um, I've even done a message about the star that led them. I've done a message about the Magi. I've done many, many different messages and it dawned upon me as I was reading the scripture, I have never done a message or reading the scripture before this, not just now, but I had never done a message from the shepherd's perspective, never. Oftentimes, um, and I think I've done it as well, I've thought about the shepherds and kind of keep them in the same category as the magi who we call the three wise men. Um, and it's not, it's not the same, obviously, but I, I kind of just put them together for some reason. I don't know why. But when I read the scripture this time, I said, wait a second, this is this is unique. This is very interesting. So I want to read just the part about the shepherds one more time. And um, that starts at verse eight there. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. Amen. And then he goes on again, the angel went on and said that he'd be um, this baby swaddled in the manger and that kind of thing. Um, he goes on and talks about what the circumstances would be. But um, they went, he went and said to the angel went after that and said, and suddenly, there was an angel and a multitude of heavenly hosts. So the one angel came and presented the news. And then all of a sudden, there were all these other angels that were around them. And the shepherds could see them as well at this point. So I started thinking about um, what the angels were, or I'm sorry, what the shepherds were going through. And, and what about these shepherds? Who are these people? And um, the more I went back to, you know, just different studies I had done and that about these different scriptures, I said, well, this is a very unique perspective when it comes to the shepherds, okay? Think about when we send out birth announcements, when we have the, you know, the birth of a, a baby in our family and the announcements that go out. Typically, when it's our child, you know, being born, um, or it could be a, a niece or a nephew. When my, when my uh, first cousin was born, my mom did all of the birth announcements um, as well. well she, she did them with um, her then sister-in-law. She's passed on now. But um, she did those birth announcements with her just to get them out. And so this is something that is done. It's, it's held in high regard and, and done in the family. And these birth announcements are sent out, sent out nowadays with the pictures and that kind of thing. And all this pomp and circumstance at this point, but they're sent to the people that are closest to us, right? The people that are most important in our lives. They're sent out to our um, family, our friends, uh, maybe some special acquaintances, right? But people that are very, very close to us, people that are near and dear, and we'll probably keep that birth announcement as a keepsake. And they will treasure that for years to come. Um, when also you can send it to people that um, are considered important. When Trinity was born, um, I not only sent, uh, or we had the announcements um, that went to a few people on Facebook, I think it was. We didn't send out printed anything. However, one that was printed that I sent out, I just a handwritten announcement, I sent to the White House because. Uh, <laughs> Obama was president then, and I wanted something, some kind of keepsake. And so they did, in fact, from that office, send a congratulations. And so we still have that in her keepsakes that said, you know, welcome to the world, Trinity Faith, and, you know, all these things. So that's something that she'll have to treasure. But she was just that important that I felt like I'm sending it to the White House, too, and see what happens. Now, I'm not stark raving crazy because during that time, if you all remember, um, Michelle Obama had the um, Joining Forces initiative. Um, but before it was called Joining Forces, before she even coined the name, 
I was calling the White House regularly because I had Calvary House and um, I was getting all the information and working with the then point of contact on um, getting the veterans everything they actually needed and not just things that we perceived that they needed or wanted. And so um, I, I had the number to the White House in my phone, in my cell phone. So I'm like, I'm sending it and see what happens. So we got that that um, keepsake for Trinity. But we send those birth announcements out and they're a big deal, right? They're a big deal when we send them out. But here we have a birth announcement that we just read that came from the angels to shepherds, to shepherds. Now, we talked about a caste system for a minute um, in um, Bible study last evening. And when it came to a caste system, shepherds were at the bottom rung. They were at the lowest of the caste system. They would have been considered the poorest of the poor. Um, people would overlook them. They didn't get a lot of respect, you know, nothing like that. But the angel, and the angels can't do anything that they're not directed by the Lord to do, right? they made this announcement to the shepherds. They were the first announcement. They were the first to hear the announcement of the birth of Christ, these shepherds. So it made me wonder, what was it about these shepherds? What was it that made them, um, for lack of a better term, worthy? You know, if we think about the way other people looked at them back then, what would make them worthy of the announcement of this baby being born? Well, when you look at it and, and kind of do a little bit of research, you find that these shepherds were actually the shepherds who were in charge of the temple flock. That's what these shepherds, that's who these shepherds were. That's who they would have been. And so they had um, oversight of those particular, of that particular flock, of those lambs that were held for sacrifice in the temple. And I said, well, that stands to reason, Right. Because here we had the birth of the lamb, right? The lamb of all lambs, the great lamb, the ultimate lamb, right? Mm -hmm. And they were the ones that were going to see him first. Now, the, the shepherds who were in charge of the temple flock had to make sure, they were trained to make sure that there were absolutely no ble blemishes, no um, markings, no um, deformities, nothing wrong with these uh, lambs. Because again, they were going to be the ones that were sacrificed unto God and they had to be perfect. Only perfect lambs could be used for a sacrifice. And so these shepherds were trained to see any defect at all, any blemish at all, any spot at all. Um, and they could not be used. So they, once they picked through those lambs that could be used in, for a temple sacrifice, a sacrifice unto God, then they had to take care of those lambs because only those lambs would be able to provide atonement for sin. Amen? Now, um, any flaw at all, I mean, I have to stress that any flaw at all would have considered, they would have been considered useless um, as sacrifices unto God. And so they were being sent to look at the lamb. Amen? And to because they were trained to see blemishes, they were trained to see flaws. That's what they would have honed in on. And so when they saw Jesus, no, they couldn't find a flaw. Amen. They couldn't find a blemish. They couldn't find a wrinkle. Just like the church that he's coming back for, there was no wrinkle, no spot, nothing on our Lord and Savior, even as a baby. Amen. That could render him useless to be the sacrificial lamb, the one who took atonement for our sins. And so why were they there? Because that was another thing I wanted to look at. Obviously, we know why they, uh, why the announcement was made to them now, but why were they there in that spot? We have also been mentioning for the past few weeks in Bible study, and I think we also mentioned it one time, even in the book of um, the study of the book of Revelation that we're doing right now, that there is no way that Jesus could have been born at this time. And I just want to stress that just because we have, you know, for we as Christians, it doesn't matter to us, right? It doesn't matter. Um, we, we're we going to serve and, and worship and praise our Lord and, and praise God that he chose to come in on this earth regardless. But there are so many who don't believe and there are so many that make it almost a career of trying to tear the Bible to shreds and to tear Christianity to shreds. And I just want to put the message out there that we already know this. You're not telling us anything that we don't know, 
Amen. There's not um, anything in the Bible that says it was in December. So you may want to study a little bit more to try to tear down our word, to try to, to, to try to infringe on our faith, our belief in our Lord and Savior, because the point is, is that he was here. But I just wanted to just touch on the fact that, yes, we already know he wasn't born in the winter. He was more likely born in spring or summer. How do we know that? Because that's why the shepherds were there. The harvest, um, and it's the same harvest time now in Israel as it was those thousands of years ago. The harvest time um, during that time, um, that agricultural year would have begun in autumn, okay? And so that would have been right around that feast or festival of the tabernacles. And the harvest in Israel. Um, when this is over, it asks, she asks if any Hold on one sec. Okay. The harvest. Let me mute Sister Denise. Hold on. Okay. So the harvest in um in Israel would have started um right around the month of Adar, what they call it, and that's February and March. So we're talking about early spring during that time. Now we know that livestock has a tendency to feed on in the fields. And so there's no way that they would have had them there during that um, the time of planting or during the time of harvest. So they wouldn't have been there during any of this time. They would have had to have been there right after that time, because typically after the harvest, then those farmers would have allowed um, the shepherds to come in with the livestock and they could glean what was left. They could eat the the maybe the seeds that were um, scattered after the harvest and that kind of thing, and they got a benefit from it because they would have the sheep would have given them manure that was valuable otherwise <laughs> if they weren't in those fields and they needed that for the next planting and the next harvest. So this season that this took place, it had to be during that time when the shepherds were allowed to have their flocks right there in that place and that would have been in Bethlehem and just outside of Bethlehem and we know that these particular shepherds were just on the outskirts of Bethlehem but close enough to where they could get to um, see Jesus quite quickly they couldn't have jumped in the bins and gone to see Jesus right <laughs> they had to walk it out with their flocks so they would have been close enough that they would have been able to do this but they were then camping out in those agricultural fields, amen? So that's why they would have been right there during that time. They would have been very close um, to where Jesus was born. And so they didn't go out after this major announcement was made and seek Jesus in a big place. They didn't go seek him like um, the royal family when a baby is born in the royal family over in the UK, you know that they're going to take the obligatory um, picture of the, the mother and on the staircase at that hospital where they always go. And then they're going to go home to the palace, one of the many palaces, right? Well, they didn't go look for Jesus in a palace, even though he was more royal than Harry or Charles or any of the rest of them could ever be in a million lifetimes. Amen. They didn't seek him in a mansion at the top of Bel Air. They didn't seek him um, outside of Beverly Hills. They didn't seek him in all of these places. They didn't go to one of the colossal inns that are in Denver, right? They didn't go to any of these places that are known to have the wealthy residing there. He was worthy of that, right? He was worthy of all those things, but they went to a place where the animals were born. Amen, where the animals would have been. I just want to show you just for one second um, what that would have look, looked like. And I'm, I'm showing you this because um, I'm kind of piggybacking on what Pastor Frazier um, talked to us about last week, about that covering. Amen. And so when we look at the house where Jesus would have been, I know you can't see the words. It's probably a bit small. But at the top here, that top part, that um, the upper floor, the upper room, so to speak, that's when they talked about the inn. That's what was called the inn, where it says there was no room left at the inn. The inn is, it kind of translates to what we would consider um, a spare room 
or the guest room. That's what the inn is there. There was no room there for the guests, okay? No more room for any more guests, I guess I should say, because it was filled up because again, it was tax time, it was tax season and they had to go into town and handle that. So it was quite crowded. And so where the visitors would have been given residence, there was no more room. And so there's Jesus there on the bottom floor. And you can see all the way over to my right, um, on, the, on the right side, to, I should say toward my right. Um, that's where the animals would have been, where that little gate is. That's where they would have been born. And so that's where Jesus was. And he was there in that manger and wrapped in swaddling clothes. clothes. That's where the shepherds went to look for them. Not any place where you would expect royalty to be, but it's certainly a place where you would expect the lamb to be born. Amen. And that's where the lamb was born. He just happened to be the ultimate lamb. Amen. And so here we have shepherds who were considered the lowest of the low, but had a very tra trained eye and a keen sense of, of perfection, what was perfect. They went to where they knew the lamb would be born, amen, and they could just carry out their job. So in this case, the one who is typically looked out, down upon is the one who had the greatest job there was, amen? And that's why it's something that is very important to note. My dad used to tell me because my grandmother and grandpa used to tell him, you don't look down on anyone. You respect everyone the same from whoever is considered the lowest of the low in whatever, in whatever from whoever's point of view to whoever is the highest of the high. You treat everyone the same with the same respect because you have no idea who they're going to become, who they are going to be. And they just deserve as a fellow human being to be treated with that respect. Amen. My grandma Timor put it a different way. She talked about, uh, often talked about burning bridges. And of course, if you mistreat someone, you're burning a bridge. And she said, don't go around burning bridges unless you have the boat, because that person that you're looking down on may end up being the one that has the yacht that'll pull you out of the sea. Amen. And so here we go with that. They didn't go um, looking in a mansion, they wouldn't have been accepted there anyway, right? Because they would have been looked down upon, but they went to where, what they knew, where the angel told them to go, they went, they knew about the, the stables, they knew about the lambs, and they went to look for a lamb in a place where a lamb would be born, amen? So we praise God in this sense that God uses everyone from whoever's considered the lowest of the low to whoever's considered the highest of the high, he listens to those people who will listen to him, amen, who will be used by him and they chose to be used by him. So here we have this lamb that is there without spot, spot, without blemish. And we thank God that he was then the ultimate lamb. He was the lamb who came. Once again, in Bible study, um, yesterday we talked about, um, as we're studying the book of Exodus, that um, in that Passover season, they were to take a lamb for a household. Before that, when we studied Genesis, there was a lamb for each person. Each person had to atone for their sins. So these same shepherds that were over that the, the temple flock um, were the ones back then who would have been able to, cho to choose um, a lamb for each person, right? That they can sacrifice unto God as, a, as an atonement for their sins had to be for each person. By the time we got to Exodus, it was for each household. By the time we went a little bit further, um, closer to the, the New Testament, but um, still in the Old Testament, but closer to it, there was a lamb, a sacrifice for each nation. And here we have the birth of the lamb, the ultimate lamb, who the lamb of the world, the one who came to take on the sins of the world. We have the ultimate lamb right here that was born in a manger. Amen. Amen. And we praise God, like I said, that he chose to take on humanity and to come in that form so he could experience everything that we could ever have experienced. So we have no excuse when we say we fall into sin, we fall prey because that same lamb who was blemish free at birth remained blemish free throughout his lifetime on earth, walked the same kind of steps that we walk, had the same kinds of temptations that we had, um, had the same kind of language that was going on, whatever we have 
filthy language here. They had their form of filthy language there. There were people who got drunk. There were people who got high. All of that was the same. It was just a looked a little bit different. But that lamb chose to remain blemish free throughout his lifetime. And even to the point when he got to that point where they started yelling for Barabbas, one who was absolutely blemished and spotted and tainted, a man full of sin, they hollered for him. And Pontius Pilate had to even say at that point, I have found no fault in this man. So from birth to death, there was no fault. He was blemish free. He was the perfect lamb who came to take away the sins of the world. Amen. It was that same lamb that slept in a manger that would grow into manhood. And like we talked about yesterday, would give himself as that sacrifice in his most virile time of life. In the time that he was the strongest, in the time that he was the most keen and the most esteemed among men, he chose at that point to give his life. And even the one who was there to convict him said, I find no fault in this man. So it was that same baby that the shepherds knelt by when they knelt by that manger, amen? And then when they got up from the manger, what did they do? They went and they spread the word. They gave their own announcement to the world that what? That Mary had a little lamb, amen? Gave that announcement and people listened. It's just like when we talked about the woman at the well. This woman wasn't of high esteem. She wasn't one that was going to be respected. And lo and behold, she was a woman who they weren't going to listen to anyway. But when she went and told them, amen, that this is the one who's here to save you, they listened. Now we say they had, the, the, before that, there were these shepherds and they listened. So the message today is, Whatever you think you are, whoever you think you are, the highest of the high or the lowest of the low, God can use you, but particularly to those who have felt that they were less than all of these years. This is who I want to talk to right now. These people that feel like they're not worthy, that feel like they can't, that feel like they don't have the title or they don't have the last name or they don't have the money or they don't have the big house or they don't have the fancy car to be listened to. God used the shepherds to announce the birth of the king. If God used the shepherds and loved them and looked upon them, please don't ever think of yourself any lower. Amen. Do not ever think that way. Look in the mirror and say you are worthy because that same Christ, hallelujah, that laid in the manger is the same Christ who grew up. There was found no fault in him and he gave his life for you. He gave his life for me. He gave his life for all of those who would say yes. He didn't give his life because somebody's last name is Rockefeller or Carnegie. He gave his life to the Roosevelt's and to the Smith's and to the Joneses. Amen. He gave his life not only to um, those who were the kings of the, the King Charles and the King Edwards. He gave it to Sam and Paul and John and Anne and Stacy. He gave it to everyone, hallelujah. He laid down his life for everyone and he laid down his life for you. And if I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times, if you were the only one on this earth, he would still have been born and laid in that manger, white, wrapped in the same swaddling clothes, went through his life as the son of a carpenter, did a little carpentry work himself, hung out with finch fishermen, people who were in bars and people who were also looked down by the rest of the world, walked around in the dust and had dirty feet, had long hair, had his beard um, that, that grew out and was probably unkempt from time to time because they didn't have combs and all the products that we have right now um, for all of these metrosexuals that have to keep themselves all coiffed, right? He wasn't like that. Amen. And neither were his disciples. They had to be a scary crew rock, walking down the street. So please don't think of yourself any lower than anyone because you are not. If God used the shepherds, if God used the woman at the well, if God used that woman with the issue of blood that crawled through the crowd on fours to get to him, Amen. If God used that woman who was bold enough to crawl through another set of crowd and, and go into that house and let her hair down and wash his feet, those same feet that were riddled with dirt and grime and dung, and she took down her hair and dried his feet after she washed them with her tears and poured out her ointment. Amen. That alabaster box that was saved for women who were going to be married. Amen costs much money. 
and she poured that out on him and cleaned his feet with her hair. If he used all of these people, certainly he can use you and me. Amen. He was the lamb who was born in the manger. He's the same one that is coming back for his church without spot or wrinkle. Let him use you. Let him fill you up with his glorious Holy Spirit. Let the lion of the tribe of Judah roar all over you and fill you and engulf you with that power. Amen. Because he had a job to do on this earth and you have a job to do on this earth. Don't ever let anyone tell you different and don't ever let anyone let you think that you are not capable, able, or worthy of doing the job and fulfilling the purpose that God has had for you to fulfill even before the foundations of the earth. He was thinking about you then, he's thinking about you now, and he will think about you when he comes back for his church on fire.